Macedonia is a country in the Balkan Peninsula in southeast Europe. It's one of the successor states of the former Yugoslavia, from which it declared independence in 1991. Since 2006, the conservative Virmo Dvemni party has been in power, associated with the names of Gluevski, who was prime minister until recently, and Ivanov, elected as the new president. 25 years after the referendum that established Macedonia's independence, its citizens started in April 2016, standing up in defense of their own democracy and the rule of law in their country. The protesters were asking for the withdrawal of the pardons given to politicians involved in massive corruption scandals, for a transparent judicial process and the inclusion of civil society in resolving the political and economic crisis. Macedonians protested against the government in up to 20 cities for months. Pavlov, you're one of the most recognizable faces from the protests that happened here in Macedonia recently. I'll show you a couple of images and while we're watching them, tell us what you remember from these days. Uh, it was a very difficult period and first of all I am one of many recognizable faces of the protest. Here is me committing a misdemeanor, I think, painting the triumphal gate. <laughs> uh, the thing is, what I most remember basically is building new friends, building new friendships. Yes, it was a very difficult time. Yes, uh, we were tested a lot. Uh, we were pushed to our limits, but we managed to succeed and to uh, to have very big results, with, which was previously unimaginable. And the only reason why we managed to do that is because we stick together till the end. Mm -hmm. Maybe Nothing give us less. some idea of what those results are. What would you say were the results? Well, uh, for example, uh, over here you have shots and videos from two different times of protesting. One of them was last year when the leader of the opposition published a legally wired up conversation produced by the uh, secret services that basically contained uh, conversations for covering up a murder of a 18-year-old in the main square in Skopje on the celebration of the ruling party's victory in the elections. So basically what happened was on their celebration, a member of the police killed uh, a, a small boy, a young boy, because he wanted to come too close to the prime minister and to say hi. And uh, the things just got worse from then. then uh, they tried to cover it up. We still don't know the truth. Uh, the case is still under investigation from the special prosecution office. But the day when the um, opposition leader published those conversations, we uh, spontaneously gathered in the streets. And uh, that's when the protestera movement started, basically. Uh, and because um, the political processes were still ongoing, we weren't able to have uh, such visible uh, success that year. But uh, the thing that we were able to do is to, is to wake up the critical thought among the, the broader public. Uh, so, um, that thing continued this year. Basically, we gave every shot to the regular political processes when the parties just sat together and tried to, to make a deal. Uh, the most important part, by my account, uh, of that deal was the establishing of the Special Prosecution Office. Uh, that's uh, a prosecution office that's independent from, the, from, from our current system that's extremely politicized and partisan. And um, their jurisdiction should have been an investigation of every criminal act contained in the thousands and thousands of wiretap conversations. Uh, just for illustration, our Secret Service uh, monitored the communications of over 20,000 citizens in the period from 2008 to 2015, which is 
uh, a number several times higher than the Stasi count uh, that happened in their entire period of, of existence. Uh, so it is, <laughs> if it wasn't so ugly, it, it would have been extremely funny. But uh, what happened is the following. Uh, we, managed that, uh, we managed to find out uh, in the difficult way that uh, as long as the Prime Minister and his party are on, are on power, there is no way to see justice because they used every political mean that they had at their disposal to block the work of the Special Prosecution Office. And that uh, blockade uh, culminated with a single stroke of a pen from our so-called president, president, Georgi Ivanov. By the way, the elections of our so-called so president and of this government are under criminal investigation um, for, for being uh, suspected, uh, suspected of massive electoral fraud. When, uh, so, on April 12, our so-called president, Georgi Ivanov, with a single stroke of, of the pen, abolished 56 politicians for 216 criminal acts from every kind of criminal responsibility. And that was the day when our final stage of the protests started. So, uh, the very single day, there were thousands of, peoples, of people that came to the streets and they demanded justice. At the beginning, there were some frictions and, and some conflicts with the street, uh, with the police. But uh, several days after the beginning of the protest, we started using paint as, as a mean for a manifestation of our revolt and of our, of our anger. And uh, things continued to, uh, continued to go on without, um, without any violent conflicts between demonstrators and, and the police whatsoever. Um, faced with that unique pressure that they didn't have any counter-defense against, uh, they had to uh, uh, they had to take a step back. So basically, one and a half, uh, one month later, our government cancelled the elections that were scheduled for June 5th, uh, and one and a half months la later, the president abolished the abolitions. Uh, I mentioned a word about the elections. One of the one of the main issues of the political agreement between the parties that happened last year is that they are going to settle their differences on elections, on fair and, and uh, free uh, elections. But uh, the conditions for having fair and free elections were not met. And the result of that was the fact that uh, the government and the ruling party scheduled their elections for, for June 5th, and they were the only party that they applied. Yeah. And they wanted to have that elections, where only one party uh, had their candidate for the members of parliament. Mm. So and, and it would have been crazy. Yeah, so let's come to the elections, because there's elections here on the on 11th the, of December, yeah. right? In 16 days or something. Yeah. Some people have been saying, you know, um, what hope have we got from the elections? That the, some of the candidates are the same, the main parties are the same. You're maybe not going to agree with that because you're one of the candidates, yeah. if I understand, <laughs> right? So, I mean, talk us through what hope you see from the elections, and are the elections enough? Whatever the result, are they going to be enough to change No, uh, they're not enough, but they're the only chance that we are going to get. So there are several things to consider here. Uh, what we have learned is that Gruevsky, Akhmeti and their regime won't step down from power willingly. Uh, because if they do, they are facing jail. For them, this is not a political combat. This is a combat for freedom. Because they have committed such numerous crimes that uh, they are facing um, sentences from, f f uh, for multiple and multiple years of imprisonment. Um, when we are speaking about the situation, is it, uh, the is it the same now as it was before? I would say determinedly no. Uh, the reason uh, is as follows. So basically you have the pro-government side and you have the opposition side. None of them were in the past open for cooperation with non-partisan members or civil society. That all changed last year. The opposition came forward and uh, approached the non-governmental organization, the civil society. And they said, look guys, we, we, cannot, bring them down, uh, uh, we cannot bring them down alone. Uh, we have a serious combat with criminals in power and we need your help. And uh, the coalition citizens for Macedonia was established. Uh, it, it was a coalition from every single opposition party with more than 130 non-governmental organizations from all around Macedonia. And um, the main thing here is that the opposition political parties learned that they cannot uh, continue forward if they continue to use the same methods as they have before. So they opened their politics, they opened their programs, they opened appro their approach for uh, attitudes and um, uh, communication with the civil society and with, and with the non-governmental organization. 
But uh, last year we still had some friction um, among ourselves in our communication. And we did not manage to present such unified front as we did this year. This year when the abolitions came and, and when the colorful revolution started, uh, every single opposition political party unconditionally supported us. They didn't interfere in our, in our political demands. Uh, they didn't ask for anything. They just said, look guys, we are behind you. You do your thing. Um, and as the protest progressed and as it became clear that um, this regime can only be brought down from power via elections, they again came uh, towards us and, says, uh, and said, look, we are aware that the bringing down from power of Nikola Gruevski and Ahmed is only the beginning. We are aware that the systemic reforms are needed in Macedonia in, in order to have a chance of one day being truly democratic society. And we are aware that we cannot do it alone. Let's do it together. So it was a very noble step and something that wasn't ever seen before in Macedonia from a political party. It was pretty risky for us because we, we knew very well uh, with whom are we getting into battle and with whom are we getting into a political battle. But uh, on the other hand, it was the only way. The only way that Gruevski is going to step down from power peacefully is if he is beaten in his own arena, in the political arena. How, how are you so sure that you're not being instrumentalized by certain parts of the elites? That the, the, the revolution is not somehow being yeah, captured? Yeah. Uh, well, the meaning of the word instrumentalization here is the key. If you are speaking about uh, being instrumentalized in order for the opposition to get more votes, yes, I am, and I am instrumentalized willingly. I am placing my face, I am placing my experience, I am placing my strengths, my weaknesses up in the front in order to get more votes for the opposition, um, uh, where I am a part of. But uh, how am I aware that we are not going to be instrumentalized totally in a political and partisan sense? We are not going to allow it. Uh, because uh, the very first moment that, the, that any of the opposition party, when they come to power, start acting the same, I am going to raise my voice. If by any reason I get corrupted, I get influenced, etc., and, and I remain silent, the very same people that I protested with will protest against me. And there is no doubt in my mind about that. Theodora, you're part of the student plenums here in Macedonia. Maybe explain what the plenum was. Uh, is it still going? How has it evolved? Right, so the plenum started as an initiative from students. Um, it was actually an, an, a sort of reaction of young students in Macedonia towards this exam that the government wanted to introduce. Uh, it was a state exam that would regulate whether we can be uh, seen as bachelors or non-bachelors, something that we believe that has, has been infringing the autonomy of our university and therefore we decided to take things in our own hands. Um, the first thing that we did is proclaim an autonomous zone so we took over the university, uh, specifically uh, the main campus of the university, where we held our own lectures, our own classes. We taught other students of uh, what is autonomous zone, uh, what does democracy mean, so what is student activism. We later on uh, organized one of the biggest protests in Macedonia and maybe the only protest that was being held of that magnitude for the last maybe 10 years. Uh, it involved 10,000 students. Um, the beauty of the student plenum is, wasn't in only the achievement that we got, we got out of it. We stopped this, the state exam from getting into our uh, autonomy in the university. But what we did is we sparked this sort of protest culture within our country again that has died out. I think a lot of people, not only students, were impressed by the power that, of what a protest, of what activism can do, of what specifically young people can do, and that inspired them to take on the streets on other social issues. Mm. And now in the run-up to the elections here, how is the attitude of the student activists evolving? Are they involved in the elections? Are they involved in parties? Uh, right, so uh, the plenum, although is not that big as it was, 
it does have its own problems uh, that some of them are not specifically related to this upcoming elections. However, we did have problems with student elections. We felt that the body that was governing that was governing us as students was not eligible to do so, was illegitimate, was using corruptive means to get to power. And so we, uh, what we wanted to do is create a protest during the latest elections, which we, were, we thought that were fraudulent. And how the government reacted to that, they sent approximately somewhere around 60 police officers, special unit police officers, against roughly 20 students who were protesting peacefully. Uh, it was a quite violent night. Uh, and we expected that it would spark um, some sort of reaction from other people, from institutions, that this is wrong, that peaceful protests done by 20 students should not be uh, something that is dealt with with a lot of physical power from special units. However, I think um, people are overwhelmed in the society of what bad things can happen here, of what corruption is, that, uh, how it's entrenched within our society. And I think this has discouraged a lot of students or maybe frightened a lot of students that maybe um, change sometimes can happen, but sometimes at what cost should it happen and whether we should sacrifice our own safety for, especially if you live in Macedonia, to, to fight for some social issues. Right. So on the plus side, uh, I think that movements such as the plenum are big and powerful when they can galvanize a lot of people since I think most governments are afraid of numbers, mostly numbers, and then uh, everything else that follows. But when you try to act as a smaller group, as a small group of people, I think uh, there are a lot of ways that your freedom, not, not only your freedom, but also your security can be endangered. And I think in those sort of circumstances, maybe people should be either careful of whether they should plan up front. Uh, I should say that this wasn't a planned protest, it's just something that happened. But again, I would say that people should be uh, and should plan up front of everything they want to do. And specifically to this elections, I think a lot of people are aware of what they can do or what they should do. So I'm not sure, but I feel that a lot of students will react to the elections, whether they go in the direction that we wanted to go or the opposite direction. Mm. I wanted to ask you about the perception of the student plenum, mm -hmm. uh, perhaps by all the parts of the population. How is, how is the student's protest and mobilization received by other parts of the population? And have the students in the plenum thought about how to build coalitions with other parts of society? Um, I don't think we want to build a coalition. I think we want to be independent, not an official actually body, but a non-official group that's uh, above all an idea of what students have to do to fight for their own education and for their own governance as students in their university. Uh, regarding the influence on other people, as I said, I think that the biggest achievement of the plenum wasn't the galvanization of only students, but the galvanization of a whole nation that managed to pursue people to get out and protest and to make them realize that if you protest in large groups, you can actually make a huge change. There's been over two years of quite remarkable protests here in uh, Macedonia, triggered in part by revelations about the political class, about all kinds of corruption, incredible uh, stories. But I want to ask about some of the social conditions underlying the uh, unrest, um, social conditions which must be different in different parts of the country. So maybe I could turn to you first, Ivana, to, to say something about that. Yes, well, uh, social conditions are that uh, in this country we have uh, so much social differences like between the poor people and uh, the rich people which uh, the rich are well, like 5% of the country and we have a huge poverty in the country uh, but also there is inequality before the law so this country has a deep need for uh, rule of law 
And um, then we, we started with the protest two years ago, with the students' protest, and then that continue with uh, the protest for the political crisis and the wiretaping scandal. But the, the conditions that uh, lead to that are very much uh, social because there are social differences and ethnic differences in this country, and that's uh, uh, a quite problem. Maybe, uh, Vlora, you can, you can continue on the same theme in, in, in explaining the ways in which the social demands came out through the protests. I mean, what kind of demands were there beyond rule of law and a decent political class? I mean, maybe... As, as an observer and as, a, as being part of the protest, I, I, I've seen that not a lot of the country's poorest were part of the protest. Most of the, uh, the protests were with uh, civil society organizations uh, which were concerned about the rule of law and the uh, wiretaping scandals and most of them were maybe co some concerned citizens but I did not um, see the poverty uh, line in, in, in inside the protest even though I believe uh, the reason why this is so I believe is because these people are b being um, concealed from, from from the media and even from from uh, revealing their problems because the government uh, or the ruling party has a way of uh, shutting their uh, cry uh, down with uh, subventions uh, with um, uh, giving them some little parts some crumbs here and there so they're they're shutting their voice down so they cannot show the, the, the their true self it's interesting that you say that some groups were not taking part in the protest. It would be interesting to hear a little bit more about the, the ethnic composition of the protests and also, maybe you come in on that, um, how in this run up to the election period, uh, you know, different parts of the society are, are making claims or making demands. Uh, the, the ethnic differences uh, has in history in this country. So, uh, but after the student protest where the student plenum uh, which led uh, the student protest was the first initiative that had Albanian community and Albanian language on the on the uh, talking to the public. Uh, we uh, sort of um, uh, we did uh, manage to to work with that uh, ethnic differences, but. Uh, the governmental parties are making remarks about the ethnic differences. Uh, someone wants to stole, steal our country, the Albanians will come and they will take your country, they will take your language, they will take your constitution. And uh, we have then, we have ethnic, uh, multi-ethnic uh, uh, differences, but I think that now we are sort of, uh, managing that uh, and uh, this is uh, just an issue for the governmental parties and for the governmental propaganda. Oh, well, uh, I can talk this from a different perspective because I'm Albanian and that's considered a minority in this country. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, the, the, when I started to get integrated to the society, it was actually when I started university, when I was 18 years old. And until then, there was the separation. I was not really included with, even though I lived in a, a mostly uh, Macedonian neighborhood, I only had like friendly relations. And I think this is the problem because at, uh, we're not getting integrated enough. We're not communicating enough with each other. Uh, but uh, during the last period, during the last two years, I've seen a lot of Macedonian and Albanian and other ethnic, ethnic um, minorities in Macedonia communicating with each other, which, which is a very good thing because it means that we are overcoming this concept of nationality, which is really um, uh, uh, falsely constructed. I, I do not believe in the concept of nationality, person, nationality personally. So if we overcome this process, we can create a, a really a, a beautiful country in Macedonia, and it is possible. We, we, uh, we saw it in the protest. Um, but if we talk about the composition of ethnicity in the protest, I think it was mainly Macedonia. That's because um, uh, maybe Albanians were, uh, be, uh, were not feeling that these problems were theirs. Because mainly of the wiretap and scandal, we can see that mainly it was uh, with Macedonian uh, politicians. But um, 
it was this uh, this class that was part of the project, this Albanian class, this higher class. So we are talking now even with another problem, with classes within the ethnic communities. Are these higher classes being more aware of the problems and this lower, uh, let's say, uh, classes that are being discriminated, uh, uh, they, they think about survival and not about these, these uh, civic issues that are happening in our country. But if we integrate them, uh, if we um, address this, um, class issue and if we get more integrated in the school system, in the education system, I think we can overcome that and there have been really positive signs of overcoming this at can least these past two years. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that we made a step towards, uh, because we understood all of us, Macedonian, Albanian, Serbs, Turks that are living here, that uh, the one enemy is the governmental uh, party and establishment because they are the richest party in Europe. They uh, wiretaped us and they stole our money so from our taxes. Uh, and now we have a common enemy so they need a propaganda story that we are uh, like ethnic uh, communities that we are enemies be, uh, between each other. But that is, uh, I, I agree, we have to work on integration. We have to work on educational system. We have to work to understand that uh, the nationality or, or the religion is not an issue because we, uh, we live in the same system. Bedran, I, I want to I bring you in um, to react to what you've heard, but also maybe to zoom out a little bit and, and say what the, um, what the significance is perhaps of actually what's an extraordinary series of protests and also political events in this country, but not unique in the region in terms of protests and also scandal. I mean, when, we, when we look in, in zoom in into Macedonia and then zoom out, what we basically see in looking into the protests and this call for revolution, uh, is that there is a mixture of reasons. So first of all, there are some social underlying conditions, and this is simply the fact that there was no convergence for Macedonia from the Western Balkan societies in the last 20 years, the convergence that was promised in socioeconomic terms. And there are even statistics that are telling us that if the countries will develop and have uh, annual growth rates of 4 to 5 percent, they will need at least 30 to 40 more years to catch up with the European countries. So there is an underlying social condition, the inequalities, the division between mobiles and non mobiles the poor uh, and the rich. Uh, and then there are the political trigger moments. And, and, and what we have seen in Macedonia in the last few years uh, is a kind of a common, almost unfortunately, European momentum uh, of regimes uh, that uh, fake democracy, establish a strong rule inside the country, use different techniques and tools to keep the rule and mon monopolizing or instrumentalizing the ethnic questions is something that we have seen in Bosnia, we have seen between Serbs and Croats, and we have it all across Europe. I mean, Orban is doing nothing else than just putting the emphasis on this national uh, retrograde question. Uh, so we, we see that kind, so many, many, many points in the Macedonian uh, situation which can be generalized, but the common denominator is, and this is the huge question, there is a new chameleon, this illiberal authoritarian chameleon, uh, which is presenting itself as democratic, but at the same time destroying the notion of democracy substantially, establishing a strong rule uh, by one male leader usually, a traditional, conservative, nationalist, anti-pluralist. And this is spreading across Europe, unfortunately, and there is a need to mobilize energies. And when we then zoom in into Macedonia, this kind of mobilization of social capital that is still out there, uh, transgressing and transcending the ethnic boundaries and the class boundaries to a certain degree is something that has happened that is, is happening in Europe elsewhere and might be just a kind of a, one of the puzzles that fits into the broader European uh, picture in this broader European togetherness in action. I want to uh, maybe maybe put a difficult provocative question which is which is the following everybody obviously hopes that the elections in a couple of weeks here will bring some, some 
sort of positive change. But if, it, if they don't, if the situation doesn't change, um, because it's striking that there are obviously very local factors of what's going on, but there's also regional trends, there's things that are very difficult to be uh, adjusting to. So if the situation doesn't change, what then ought we to be doing? Um, after these two years or more of, of protests and what then should we be doing? We, we see a European line, practically, of uh, regimes that are sort of autocratic. Uh, Hungary, Turkey, um, Macedonia and Serbia has uh, uh, pretty much going fast in that uh, uh, location. So what do we do next if uh, the elections doesn't give the change? This country will stay with the old people because the youngs are going to leave the country. Like those who are uh, opposition and in this country are going to leave the country in Europe. So the Europe will have an issue with uh, economic uh, migrants. And uh, I think that uh, we, we need to fight. I, I, I'm not a pessimist now and I will not be. We need to, uh, to fight uh, even though if uh, the citizens uh, are, not, uh, are not having the same will of uh, the government that we want to see. I think that, uh, that it is true everything that you said, especially about the one that we are seeing of chain of if informality in our institutions of uh, the Balkan countries, because there are this um, EU law that is coming to our country, which is foreign to us because it's not it's not uh, native, it's not in a part of our culture. So I see uh, we see a chain of informality happening in, inside the institution. There is the law, but it's everything that happens behind the laws is totally different, and it's it's a way that let's say it's the way we work, like. Let's than Anna said in her book. So, um, uh, but the other question, what would happen in the worst case scenario, I say, um, I think that, um, yeah, that's true. Most of the young people will, will leave this country. They're already doing that. But um, uh, I, I truly believe that we could stay and fight. Uh, because uh, if uh, Macedonia g goes down, we're talking about that spillover effect. If Macedonia becomes an autocratic country, there's no place for Macedonia in Europe, and uh, Serbia will fall. I truly believe that that will happen, and uh, then other countries uh, will become uh, error skeptic. So I don't think that European Union should let um, uh, this happen. Uh, they should work on the way that they can communicate their laws to these countries in a different way, I believe, and there is a systematic change. And the other part is that we, as, as part of this country, need to fight for, for a better future in, in, in this place, because it is possible, it is possible. I really believe that uh, in this country and in the line that I said before, Turkey now is impossible, but uh, uh, the European Union and the inter international community needs another approach. What I mean but, uh, by another approach, I mean that uh, they need an open process of diplomacy for all participants, especially the civil society in the process of negotiations. I know that uh, it's not a practice in diplomacy, but uh, we are exception and at so many things, so why not in, in diplomacy? <laughs> it's, not, it's not as if the current way of doing it is working. So, so that, yeah. uh, I believe that there should be a change, yes, because uh, there is another thing. Um, uh, the international community uh, really uh, helped us through, through this crisis, especially with the negotiations. But I'm talking to from the perspective of a citizen of Macedonia, I did not feel uh, in any mo moment that these negotiations were legitimate because the four people that were actually negotiating, I did not feel them as a representative of me or any other uh, any other person. So why uh, why are we neglecting the institutions? Why this negotiation or this discussion did not happen in the parliament where uh, it actually is the the, the um, discussion or deliber uh, deliberation institution in the country? So uh, the agreement laws just went by and were accepted without any discussion in the parliament and I think it's wrong because we are under, undermining the power of formal institutions and where will citizens turn to when they have a problem if the formal institutions are not functioning right. as they should. Right. Yeah, I mean, th this is really a huge problem as this process of expelling the formal 
establish democratic institutions. Uh, I mean, not expelling, expelling the decision-making processes somewhere out of these this institutions. I mean, we have seen that in, in Bosnia, we have it in Serbia, and the people, when they decide, I mean, it started with Dayton Peace Agreement in 1995, they didn't write the constitution in the Bosnian Assembly. They went to the uh, Dayton, Ohio uh, air bases and, and wrote a constitution for Bosnia. So that kind of decision-making processes beyond or besides the democratic institutions and this kind of informalization of society is a huge problem. And at the same time, just to come to Europe and to European Union, that poses a kind of a, of a dilemma for the European Union. So they always claim that they want to negotiate with democratically elected leaders, but they, uh, in order to get stability and security, they compromise democracy and neglect democratic institutions quite frequently. This is what we just recently have seen in Macedonia in, in, in how this agreement was basically brokered. Uh, but what I still, why I do believe that the European Union uh, is a fundamental piece and puzzle that we need in the region uh, is for the simple reason. I mean, I, I do see the region already integrated into all European trends. Everything that is happening on the European level, be it illiberalism, be it financial economic shocks, is immediately coming to the region, hitting the region, and hitting the peripheries, not only this periphery. I mean, there are so many peripheries of, of Europe. Uh, and if there is not a kind of a new democratic polarization, as, as Habermas is asking for, if there is not the kind of a re-energizing core of the European Union, there will be no role model, and then what uh, might be then left uh, for the periphery will be just negotiations behind closed doors, compromising democracy yet again, but not uh, having a kind of a path towards the future. So this is one of the pieces. We need a renewed European Union a as a political and social union in order to be a vivid functional role model and uh, broker for, 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 the, for, the, for the rest of the Balkans, for example. And the second piece, just briefly, uh, we also need that kind of enthusiasm and energy that we have on European level in so many cities, just when we look to Spain and to this process of municipalization, how they come together and work and, and outline or create a mobilization around fundamental issues, fundamental social issues like health, uh, housing, etc., etc. This is what we, where Macedonia, Bosnia, Serbia, fit in, and this is the moment where that kind of, 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 of enthusiasm and optimism and this kind of fighting for the right cause on the European level and then the local level at the same time might, together with the renewed European Union, offer a perspective. Otherwise, we all have to leave, but we don't want to leave. So, uh, West, East, uh, all the elements there, Vedran, we're here at the Civil Society Forum uh, in Skopje, and I mean, everything that one hears about the situation here in, in Macedonia is fascinating, but also speaks to so many wider trends that are going mm -hmm. on, not only in the Western Balkans, but perhaps right throughout Europe, perhaps even right throughout the Western world. And one of those could perhaps be a generalized crisis in democracy, actually. It seems like in many of our countries, we don't even know how to do it anymore. Mm -hmm. um, so, ha I mean, how do you see that in a country where uh, maybe there hasn't been democratic tradition, it's perhaps even tougher. Um, how do you see this relationship between crisis in democracy, crisis in the Western Balkans, crisis of Europe? I mean, generally, I don't, don't like the uh, kind of overuse of this word crisis. I mean, we, we, we got used to, to having crisis all around and all the time. So it started with the social economic crisis and financial crisis, and then it went Greek crisis, debt crisis, and migration crisis, and democracy crisis. I mean, that, that, that's, that, I mean there are trends that are worrying, uh, and if we try to portray them, uh, then we can see that in the West we have a crisis of political representation, we have a crisis of the public sphere, we have uh, democratic values and institutions challenged by right-wing uh, extremist populism uh, in, in a kind of a, a sense that, that uh, beyond the facts, uh, the politics of fear is put in the middle and, 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 and simply with simple messages and simplification, the political field is fill, filled with, with, with uh, negative connotations. So we have many worrying trends in the West, and unfortunately 216, as a 2016 was really a bad year. Uh, we face some crucial elections next year, and we will see whether the 
transnational European activists and that kind of uh, positive democratic uh, energies can uh, prevent Europe in slip from slipping into even a deeper crisis. But in any case, when we, when we just leave the European Union and go to the, to the Western Balkans and to other parts of Eastern Europe, for example, uh, we just see that there is a kind of a double crisis. So first of all, democracy has never become the only game in town in this region, which is not the case in Austria, Germany, and France, which are stable democracies, we have, which have institutions. That was a kind of a transitional process where the countries got stuck in that kind of transition towards nowhere, uh, as there is no role model, as there is an obvious, uh, obvious insight that the linear normative transformation of societies, uh, like we assumed in the 90s following 1989, is simply not delivering. And then it comes this additional kind of a crisis, uh, similar one to the West, where you have like political elites, uh, occupying the public sphere, uh, creating clientelist networks, using politics of fear, instrumentalizing nationalism, ethnic differences, etc., etc., to establish a very strong, illiberal, uh, authoritarian rule in which, and this is very dangerous, in which they pretend to be democratic and misuse democratic institutions and procedures, uh, but just for the sake of particular interests and, and, and power. And this is then that, that has become a kind of a very strong phenomenon in the region, joining the European trends, and that makes it very resistant to any kind of change that comes from outside. One of the terms that's gone along with the term of crisis, which has been overused, has perhaps been the more positive version that we're in a period of interregnum, um, that somehow we're between regimes. Now, the Western Balkans has been, in a way, between regimes, been stuck, as time. you just put it, yeah. indefinitely. Mm -hmm. How do we become unstuck? I mean, there, there are no quick fixes and there is not the magic formula to resolve it. Uh, I mean, there is a need to, to go different paths uh, and there is a need to have even a sheer luck uh, in a moment in order to fix the situation. But I believe we first of all need is definitely a revitalization of the European project. As long as the European Union is not uh, able to be the role model in terms of liberalism, openness, uh, transparency, etc., etc., there will be no way to, to move the countries and to motivate the countries and to, to support the energies, the emancipatory energies that we have in the region in order to fight for this democratic and liberal cause. Uh, this is first of all, and then uh, we definitely need uh, younger generations or generations of people that uh, like to think critically, that like the, the reflection and, and even complexity of the world that we are living in, and that are able to transfer and transform this kind of complexity into political action. And that political action, this is something where we then can join the European forces, because we have a very vivid a kind of a debate going on, even though we don't see it so much in the, in the, in the big media as they are then full of, of crisis, Trumps, Hofers and, and Le Pens. But still, as a, there is a vivid debate. This is the moment where I do believe that the Western Balkans can join the debate. Uh, and with a little bit of luck, uh, we can change the course of history.